Japan Station is made possible in part by Patreon support. And I would like to say thank you to Kelly, who just joined at the $3 a month plus alpha tier. Thank you so much, Kelly. I really, really appreciate it. It's an immense help. If you want to support the show, go check out japankyo.com slash Patreon and sign up for as little as $1 a month. And by the way, if you're not interested in the Patreon, but maybe you're looking for a t-shirt, you can go over to kimitodesigns.com. That's K-I-M-I-T-O designs.com. I have various designs over there. There. Maybe one of them might interest you. All right, so again, thank you, Kelly, and let's get on with the show. Welcome to Japan Station. I'm your host, Tony Vega. All right, so、uh, today I have a pretty、uh, standard episode for you. I have a conversation lined up with a very interesting person. But、uh, before I get to that, I just wanted to mention that the last episode was a,、uh, a bit of an exception, right? I don't normally do solo episodes, but I did one.、Uh, I hope you enjoyed it and you found something valuable in it. But normally, this podcast is about、uh, the people that I talk to, right? And the things that they have to teach us about Japan and their lives and their experiences.、Uh, that's just the kind of show that I want to make. But every once in a while, I will throw a solo episode at you. The last time I had done that was all the way back in episode 33. That one is about how I suddenly became legally blind and kind of how Japanese and Japan helped me cope with that、uh, change and the problem. That came with it. So if you're curious about that, go check that out.、Uh, again, I think it's episode 33,、uh, but I will include a link in the show notes. But anyway, let's get to today's episode. So today you're going to get to hear a conversation that I had with a writer and journalist. His name is Drew Richard. So, Drew has written extensively for the Japan Times,、uh, as well as many other publications such as the New York Times.、Uh, I believe he got to Japan in 2011 or thereabouts, and、uh, from there he started working with the Japan Times.、Uh, he has a brand new book. It actually just came out a few days ago as of the time of this recording. It's called Every Human Intention Japan in the New Century. So, of course, Drew did extensive reporting on a variety of topics while he was in Japan.、Uh, and this book is based on a lot of the experiences that he had while doing that reporting. So,、uh, the book is divided into three main sections.、Uh, section one is about African immigrants in Japan. So, there's a community of、uh, Africans, especially from Nigeria, living in Japan. And he wrote quite a bit about them.、Uh, that's section one. Section two is about a very、uh, rural, I guess. You could say kind of a dying city all the way in the north of Hokkaido, pretty much right by Russia, or at least one part of Russia.、Uh, it's called Wakanai, and he writes about kind of this dying city, aged population, and dwindling population. And then section three is all about nuclear safety, because of course that's become a huge issue in the years following the 2011 earthquake, tsunami, Fukushima meltdown. So he collects this all into one book. It's, it's a beautifully written book, and it digs deep into all these topics. He spent years and years writing about these topics, and it's collected all just wonderfully in this book. So I, I do recommend it. You can pick it up,、uh, of course, on Amazon. And if you want to use the affiliate link, it won't cost you anything extra. It's japankyo.com slash Amazon, or you can use the link in the show notes, japanstationpodcast.com, or in your podcast app. Just check the show notes. But anyway, enough explanation. I think we're ready to just dive right into it. Here is my conversation with Drew Richard. The next stop is Japan Station. The doors on the right side will open. <laughs> Right, so there's, there's so much to, to cover, but I, I did want to、uh, ask you about something that you mentioned in the intro that is not、uh, you know, part of the th- three main parts in the book, but it, it did stand out to me. And, and once I looked into it, I thought, oh, this is really interesting. But、um, you mentioned、uh, mm-hmm. Hideo Levy, who、um, I, I believe he was your mentor.、Um, could you? Talk a little bit about him and who he is, because I, when I discovered who he was, I was like, wow, I was just fascinated. Sure. So it sounds like maybe you watched, did you watch the lecture he gave at Stanford University? In- yeah, the one in 2010. Yeah. That was just 
Yeah. The, awesome. the, the title of that lecture would have been The World in Japanese. Um, yes. Yeah. Yes, yes. So, Ribi Hideo Sensei, or uh, Hideo mm -hmm. Levi, mm -hmm. um, is an mm -hmm. American writer. He's culturally Jewish, it, um, who uh, moved to Japan after some years working as a scholar of Japanese poetics in the U.S. Uh, to fulfill a lifelong mm -hmm. dream of attempting to do literary writing, uh, in his case, primarily mm -hmm. novels and, and many of them autobiographical novels in the Japanese language. Um, and that's not mm -hmm. something that had been done uh, at that point in the mm -hmm. 1980s, at least not to an extent where um, major establishment literary prizes had been given to a Western writer who had written in, in Japanese, because that's a very significant linguistic gap, and it simply hadn't been bridged in that way to the extent that the literary establishment had recognized it. Um, and he was able to do it, um, not instantly and not without much effort. And at this stage, he's somebody who's published, you know, Japanese, <clears throat> Japanese authors or novelists, they publish books at a much faster rate than... Uh, mm -hmm. their counterparts in the West. So he's done many, many books. So, you know, many of them have won important prizes and he's part of the literary establishment in Japan. And in fact, I think he's recognized and in some cases criticized for writing in a way that is very Japanese and very conscious of and redolent of um, authors like Soseki and many others who are regarded as the most essentially Japanese of literary authors. So his achievement is, is not only that he was able to do it, but that he was able to do it in this way that's um, very culturally convincing. And that's, that's been his, his literary project. Mm. And how did you um, come to meet him? Well, um, after I finished my undergrad, I had, um, I had a little bit of funding to, to travel and study literature and, mm. uh, he, I was aware of his work because he'd been my father's college roommate. Um, they, had, they, hadn't, <laughs> Interesting. they hadn't spoken in, in decades, um, you know, not since uh -huh. he'd, he'd gone to Japan. His, um, Ribi Sensei is very eccentric in, in, a, in, a, uh -huh. you know, in numerous ways. And, but I thought, you know, if, if I'm going to, I'll go to Japan and I'll look this guy up. He's done something that's really unusual and remarkable and uh, I'm young, I've studied literature, I'm not quite sure what I want to do with that, or I can think of things I'd like to do with it, but I don't know how to go about that. And it can't hurt to try to understand a little bit more about his project and, and, and how improbable it is and, and why he chose it. Um, so I did, I just, mm -hmm. yeah, he, he doesn't use modern communications devices. I mean, he communicates primarily by, um, or at that time communicated primarily by fax. So I just, you know, had to go to the university where he was teaching and, and, and look him up. And, you know, he's a very reluctant, but generous educator because uh -huh. the improbability of his career as an author in Japan is so great, or it's so improbable that mm -hmm. he has to pay very close attention to building it and maintaining it and always has. And that's part of who he is. And he knows that teaching gets you nowhere that like the universities that sign your paychecks don't care about it. Uh, the literary publishers who submit you for awards don't care about it. And yet, because he grew up really interested in the way that his father understood what he was doing and why he was doing it in terms of absorbing other mm -hmm. languages and Chinese came before Japanese for him. Um, he also is just naturally very good at passing along an understanding of literature and of language to other people. Um, and mm -hmm. in true to that element of his character, he was really reluctant to be any kind of sensei to me, but at the same time, mm -hmm. sort of, I think felt like that would be the natural thing to do and invited me to join his, uh, seminar and sort of multilingual or, or transcultural or, or so-called like border crossing literature at Jose Daigaku. Mm -hmm. Um, and mm -hmm. so that was a formative experience for me. Uh, and you know, I didn't go on to do the kind of writing that he does or even to approach writing about Japan in the way that he does. And in fact, we, we really couldn't be more different, but, uh, mm -hmm. the generosity of his opinions about literature and his ideas about Japanese literature were really sufficient for me to understand what the literary scene was in Tokyo and how literature gets produced, published, circulated, criticized in a culture that's not at all 
like the United States in terms of publishing and literary taste. So that was really valuable. Hmm. Okay. So then what, what happens that, how do you end up working with the Japan Times? Like you, you go to study to try to learn from Levi Sensei and then what, what happens in between? And then obviously once you're at the Japan Times, you, you end up working on all the stuff that ends up in the book, but could you kind of bridge that uh, space and time for me? <laughs> Sure. Well, um, Ribi Sensei's ad advice to me, well, I, I had assumed because of Ribi Sensei's background that he would tell me it was really important to use the time I had in Japan to study the Japanese language if I was interested in learning more about the literature and taking part in literary culture by way of my experience in Japan. But he felt really strongly that the literary tradition in Japan among expatriates, which is a long one that has produced some really interesting books, was primarily a history of people who maintained a kind of outsider status or outsider perspective, making good use of particular encounters with Japan. And he discouraged me from, from taking language study too seriously or making formal language study a priority. You know, he pointed out that people like Lafcadio Hearn and Donald Ritchie had had various levels of language expertise and, and it had kind of allowed them not to get too swept up in becoming part of the culture, which is an interesting thing to hear from some Someone like him, who has mm. willed a really fundamental transformation on himself in order to yeah. be closer to the culture. And so fundamentally, his advice was just try to make sense of what you see. And when some of it starts to make some sense, begin to write about it. Mm -hmm. And during that early period in Japan, um, I be one of the things that I noticed or that was interesting to me was that when you went to the red light districts, you mm -hmm. often witnessed very fraught or complicated or should I say like emotionally diverse interactions between foreign visitors to Japan from all over the world because they go to Roppongi or Kabukicho and mm -hmm. uh, the people who are working on the street trying to get them to come to nightclubs. And mm -hmm. many of those people are African or West African or Nigerian mm -hmm. or Igbo, which is to say from Southeastern Nigeria. Mm -hmm. um, and I was interested in these interactions because they were often so tortured and sometimes hostile, but other times very friendly and represented a sort of, you know, yeah. a global coming together of, of people across this boundary of, of tourism versus trying to make money off of tourists. So uh, I tried to get to know some of uh, the people working for those nightclubs, many of whom were Nigerian. And I was invited to attend events held by Nigerian civic organizations and to know more about that community. Um, mm -hmm. And I pitched an article about it to the Japan Times. Mm -hmm. The article wound up being driving a lot of web traffic for them. It was among the most viewed stories on their website that mm -hmm. year. And the editor of the community section at that time, which at the Japan Times means the foreign community section or news about the foreign community for the foreign community, uh, used those numbers to uh, leverage an opportunity or to create an opportunity to bring a longer term project about uh, the African community in general and the Nigerian community specifically uh, into the community section and to make me a regular uh, part of that section's coverage. Hmm. Wow. Yeah, that's really interesting. Like I've, I've noticed, uh, I mean, it's been quite a while, but I don't know, like 10 years ago or so, you know, I'd, I'd pass by like Harajuku, even like in some of those places, you'd see, um, like you said, the people in Roppongi doing a similar kind of job in Harajuku where they might be like in a storefront trying to get you in, to come into the store and they were African too. So, yeah. You, yeah, that's, it, there are two, two distinct chapters in the history of that community when they did mm -hmm. highly visible work that mm -hmm. Japanese people came to associate with African immigrants. And mm -hmm. actually the, the hip hop fashion business or the hip hop apparel business uh, for I think most people in the African community, some of whom have done both, some of whom did one or the other came before uh, nightlife work mm -hmm. um, started mm -hmm. probably as, as early as the mid nineties for many of them. And so it is a, a type of work that I think uh, many Japanese people associate with that community. And, and um, it's a type of work that many of them have done. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, you, you mentioned in the book kind of how there, there was 
I guess this was part of the reason for the transition, but there were issues with like counterfeiting and that kind of stuff, right? With the clothes. Yeah, it was it was another form of work that revealed how tense things can get when there isn't a clear understanding of where a group of people came from, how they mm -hmm. came to be in, in the society that's hosting them, and what their work or their, their sudden visibility means for that society. Mm -hmm. So there were definitely instances when clothes turned out to be counterfeit. There were definitely many instances when uh, people who portrayed themselves as African Americans, uh, you know, mm -hmm. because that was an attractive ethnic identity to customers of those stores, turned sure. out to be African instead. And then there were moments when people did use that, um, the importation of, of clothing to smuggle narcotics, for example. Mm -hmm. How widespread that is, uh, you know, I'm not sure that anybody has ever successfully documented that in a way that would make clear like what percentage of the community was engaged in, in that kind of criminal mm -hmm. activity or what percentage of, of the people working in that business were engaged mm -hmm. in criminal activity. But anytime there's a new group of migrants in a vulnerable economic situation, in a society where there aren't too many legitimate opportunities and where it's difficult to compete with, for example, Japanese business people, if they choose to move into the hip hop clothing business, there will mm -hmm. obviously be enticements to do things that are, you know, semi-legal in some cases and, and illegal or extra legal in others. Um, mm -hmm. So it did happen uh, and, and yeah. it did wind up in the press and it did wind up being an early instance right. of Japanese people not really knowing how to regard those communities and people in those communities not being very sure if they could trust how Japanese people were describing them or thinking of them. Right, right, right. Yeah. Like, I mean, one thing that I really, um, I, I don't know, found interesting or, or enjoyed or appreciated about, you know, that, that first part in the book was, uh, you know, you're shining a light on this group of people. It's a significant group of people. It's not, you know, a, a, a large percentage of Japan, but it's still a significant community. And it's a community that you often only hear about when, something bad happens and they make it to the news, right? And, and you see this also with, for example, um, Brazilians, um, Peruvians, that um, I also have cousins that are half Peruvian that are living in Japan. Um, you know, oftentimes you end up seeing the headlines of Peruvian did this, Brazilian did this, you know, African did this. But, you know, you, you give a much, much, much fuller understanding of, of who these people are, some of the bad stuff, some of the good stuff, the difficulties that they have there. Could you shed a bit of light on, you know, like, for example, why there are Africans in Japan in the first place and some of the, you know, things that they do aside, like we were talking about earlier with the, you know, the clothing stores and that kind of stuff, but just a, kind of a, a bigger picture? Yeah, well, in the case of the African community, we're talking about mm -hmm. 20 or 30,000 people. It's it's difficult to pin down exactly how many because the statistics mm -hmm. that the Japanese government offers are it's hazy exactly how they account for people who are, in, you know, using uh, means that are not explicitly legal to remain in the country. Mm -hmm. um, but the largest mm -hmm. group within that group is uh, is the Nigerian community. It's between three and four thousand people officially. It's probably closer to something like ten thousand um, if you you talk to consular officials off the record. And mm -hmm. um, m most of those people in the Nigerian community, although not all of them, are um, either Igbo or they're from other ethnic groups that come from the part of the country that broke away from Nigeria in 1967. Uh, after some ethnic pogroms. In other words, people from those ethnicities were being, particularly the Igbo ethnicity, were being killed uh, mm -hmm. in, um, due to ethnic tensions. And so they went back to the part of the country they were originally from and, and broke away. There was a three-year civil war. They lost that civil war and uh, their country was, or Biafra was reintegrated into Nigeria. And mm -hmm. most of, or many of the people I knew in that community would say to me, that it was inevitable that they would have to leave Nigeria in order to make a living because after the loss of the Civil War, their ethnicity was disenfranchised of its economic and political prospects in a system dominated by other groups um, mm -hmm. and groups that had defeated them during the Civil War. 
What's interesting, though, is that many of those people, despite saying that, have a personal history that includes some economic success or middle class achievements in Nigeria, and they don't actually wind up leaving Nigeria until, in some cases, the the early 90s, in the earliest cases, and then in many cases, the mid and late 90s when mm. the economy collapsed and it collapsed mm. for you know for a wide variety of reasons but that was essentially the economic low point of the country's history due to a series of dictatorships that had not taken very good care of the economy mm. and so their stated reasons are political uh the timing of their arriving in japan tends to look a little more purely economic but those two threads are very difficult to disentangle in a place mm -hmm. like nigeria and then japan is a funny place to come because it's not the uk it's not the us uh, there's mm -hmm, a very mm -hmm. serious yeah. language barrier and a very serious question of cultural integration uh, that doesn't exist yeah. if you go to countries that speak english but what Japan did have going on was through the bubble economy, which of course lasted until roughly, you know, someone, sometime between 89 and 91, we can say, um, mm -hmm. Japan was a country that was regarded as having really pulled itself by it, up by its bootstraps through like a strong manufacturing sector. Mm -hmm. And sort of the, the last thing that Igbo people had left in Nigeria when they tried to resurrect their regional economy after the destruction of the war was a handful of cities that managed to turn their economic fortunes around through manufacturing. And so some of these cities were even nicknamed the Japan of Africa. And so Japan mm -hmm. had this intense metaphorical value to many of these Igbo people who mm -hmm. saw it as a place where you could go and through the sweat of your brow, because it was a culture that understood the value of hard work, um, earn enough money to stabilize your life and potentially mm -hmm. or ideally use that money in coming back to Nigeria to, to build a stable life for yourself there, the kind of stable life you couldn't build with money earned in Nigeria after the economy collapsed. So that's what brought them there, in most cases starting mm -hmm. around 1991, 1992. Mm -hmm. So to what extent would you say that they've been able to integrate into society or uh, would it be more like they kind of make their own community and do their own thing and that's just how it is? Well, it really varies. It varies based on language ability. It varies based on mm -hmm. the quality of the marriages they entered into in mm -hmm. Japan. And of course, if you're familiar with Japan's visa system today or 20 or 30 years ago, you mm -hmm. know that uh, it's there aren't an abundance of options, comparatively speaking, compared to other countries uh, for long-term integration, especially if you entered the country on a short-term visa or in some other way that's not meant to confer a pathway to residency. And so mm -hmm. marriages to Japanese women were an important part of the way that people in that community achieved immigration stability. And anytime marriages are occurring under pressure or under the looming threat of deportation, um, they're going to vary in quality uh, and mm -hmm. in stability. And of course, all marriages vary in quality and stability, but it's just another variable on top of, sure. of all the variables that are involved anyway. And so that's a big factor, you know, how, how stable has an individual's marriage turned out to be. Um, yeah. And, and so it, it, it really, it, it varies tremendously, but as in any community of people who didn't have access to a lot of resources when they first arrived, there's probably a sense, it would be fair to say that there's a sense within that community that for most people, it hasn't worked out really well. And, and, and any genuine sort of integration has been very difficult to achieve mm -hmm. in a lasting way. Yeah, that, that's the impression that I got from reading the book for the most part. I mean, of course, there's always exceptions and all that. But for the most part, it seems like they just kind of do their own thing. And I've seen this happen with, you know, the Brazilian community and the Peruvian community, too. There's, I think it's not until you get to the second generation where they really start to kind of integrate, quote unquote, right? But that first generation, for the most part, seems to kind of stick to their own thing. You, you make you make a good point, which is that mm -hmm. now that that community is into its second generation, you can mm -hmm. see, um, you know, people who are representative of that community emerging on a in a more public way or as public figures, like probably the one who's most significant to the Igbo community in Japan is um, Okoe Rui 
or uh, mm-hmm. Louis Okoye, you know, who's a well-known mm-hmm. um, professional baseball player. His yeah, father yeah, is, yeah. is an is an Igbo immigrant to Japan, um, mm-hmm. and somebody who knew many of the people in the community. He's well known. He's a well known person in that community, and somebody who had endured many of the struggles and privations of early, uh, you know, of working in factories and and having to really get by on on hard work without a lot of help during his early mm-hmm. years in Japan. So. So there are examples of second generation um, Nigerian Japanese people or Igbo Japanese people um, Mm -hmm. being able to integrate. And I think what's really remarkable about it, and I don't know if this uh, reflects the experience of the Nikkeijin community or or those other communities you mentioned, Mm -hmm. but the the remarkable thing is that these people arrived, most of them, thinking they were just going to earn some money and go home. But then, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, dekasegi. I mean, they say that in the Nikkei community as well. Yeah, but right. a lot of them ended up staying. <laughs> but they, yeah, and then not only did a lot of them end up staying, but there was a period when they 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 weren't feeling stuck. So it's not remarkable that maybe thirty years later they they feel stuck and they feel like maybe they should have made a different decision. In some cases, I think uh-huh. what's really interesting is that many of them will tell you. You know, after I was here for like six or eight years, when I was married and I did have kids and I was earning money, there was a period and it, and it wasn't too short when I thought I would stay and I thought this could really work out and I really could be just a normal middle class person in Japanese society. And mm-hmm. that's a really remarkable thing in light of the obstacles that were involved, that they ever mm-hmm. had that optimism. And so what was interesting for me as a reporter was, okay, what happened to that moment of optimism. Somebody who shows up cynical thinking they're going to leave and then winds up cynical in the end, there's there's not much of a story there. But somebody who mm-hmm. really entertained the notion that they could fit in and then discovered that it wasn't that simple, that's more intriguing to me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. How did you meet um, Prosper, who is the kind of the main guy that you focus on in that section? But of course, from there, he branches out, talk to other people. But Prosper is the kind of the through line that you follow. Yeah, I met Prosper by observing him. Uh, you know, I was just on the street in Ropongi reporting, and mm-hmm. I saw him uh, lose his job because he refused to help uh, the owner of the club he was working for take mm-hmm. advantage of a, a Japanese patron who was drunk, and therefore it would have been very easy to take him into the bar and have him buy drinks for the hostesses and then charge his credit card. And that's, mm-hmm. a, you know, that's a very unusual uh behavior in, in the red light districts because people are, are, mm. are hard up and that doesn't just apply to Africans or Nigerians. So um, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. if somebody has put themselves in a vulnerable position, unless a person who's in a position to benefit from their vulnerability thinks they might get into trouble or get arrested for it, usually they're just going to look the other way uh, while yeah, somebody yeah, yeah. takes advantage. And so that marked him as being... Uh, Un- unusual or different from some of the other people I knew. And then it turned out that he was very aloof from the community, uh, from the Nigerian community. He really th- thought of himself as an observer of that community more than a participant. And as somebody whose whole, in my case, as somebody whose whole job was to observe, that made it easy for us to understand each other and also mm-hmm. made it appealing to me to use his way of seeing things to um, make my own way of seeing things a little bit clearer. Um, Mm -hmm. In the long run, I I think uh, I probably felt about him the way that many writers feel about their favorite characters in stories Mm -hmm. they've written, which is that it was a little too easy. Uh, And that maybe (laughs) if I hadn't been so drawn to someone who resembled myself or reflected my way of looking at things, uh, Mm -hmm. I could have done a better job. Um, but yeah, yeah. that is that is the, that was the nature of my connection to him is that he he seemed he was a person who offered a wide or panoramic view of the community by nature of his temperament or by virtue of his temperament. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, I think you know a lot of the topics that you write about in the book are big topics that are sometimes difficult to wrap your head around. But when you frame it from the perspective of these individuals, not just Prosper, but in the other parts, you also focus on specific people, you know, it, it makes it much more relatable. And, and at least I appreciated that aspect of it. And it was much easier to follow the stories because of that. So from me, from my perspective, at least. So. Yeah. And I'm not interested in mm-hmm. being an expert about Japan or presenting arguments or hypotheses about Japan or mm-hmm. explaining why Japanese culture 
is the way it is. Um, mm -hmm. I'm interested in observing people and allowing the experiences that they have to speak for themselves as metaphors for the country where they happened, the society mm -hmm. where they mm -hmm. happened, or for larger issues that transcend national boundaries. But I think you know, Japan is such a complicated and, and um, frustrating and fascinating place that it would be really foolish to try to draw any conclusions. So my way of getting out of that or weaseling out of that is, is <laughs> to, to observe people in their environment instead of yeah, uh, yeah. Uh, attempting to uh, explain what immigration in Japan is or isn't or what nuclear energy in Japan is or isn't. Right, right, right. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I do want to ask you about the other sections too, but um, just one quick question here about you. Um, you mentioned in the book that you were working, um, like your visa wasn't exactly, uh, I guess, supposed to be for working, and yet you were. What what happened there? Were you a student and you started working with the Japan Times? Is that basically what happened? No, I was always just on, you know, the 90 day tourist visas that you can really? oh. for for those of you interested in in <laughs> attempting to do what I did. And it may not work anymore. Their systems may be too smart for this. When mm -hmm. I was there, you could just come in for 90 days, go out for a day and come back for 90 days. And uh -huh, you could do uh -huh. that um, 180 days out of a given year. And it would yeah. reset on January 1st. So you uh -huh. could, in theory spend like 360 days in a row in Japan and only ever and during that period only spend three or four days outside of Japan. Supposedly right, right. I knew a lot of people who tried to do that who had been stopped and told knock this off. But I was <laughs> only ever warned once and it was a very gentle warning. Mm -hmm. Um so I never had that issue. It allowed me to spend essentially half of my time in Japan, uh a fairly large chunk of time in Nigeria in a given year, and then my mm -hmm. leftover time back in the US seeing family, finishing my graduate degree one semester at a time and so forth. Um mm -hmm. for, you know, like 7 years. Uh right. that's not necessarily a difficult or tense or dangerous thing to do except mm -hmm. when you're publishing unflattering things about the immigration <laughs> authorities and visiting yeah. visiting detainees in immigration detention centers and you know then it beca it can feel nervous um, but yeah. I'm not the only person who does this. I I, I don't yeah. want to name names because I'll probably turn out to be naming the wrong names but I think there are a couple yeah. at least two other relatively well-known Japan writers who write for major mm -hmm. periodicals, global periodicals, um, and mm -hmm. have their own books who do the same thing, who do that tourist visa shuffle. And one of them, I think, is married to a Japanese national, but just hasn't ever bothered to go through the immigration process. Right, right, right. I guess in, in that case, you end up getting paid as basically a freelance, freelance writer, just as if you were living in the U.S. or whatever, you know, somewhere else, right? Yeah, you know, the Japan Times and I took such cloak and dagger precautions to not put me in a position where I could get in trouble or they could get sure. in trouble for how they got paid yeah. that I don't think I can divulge details because okay, hopefully, okay. <laughs> hopefully they're still using it as a template to um, yeah. pay other people who may be in a similar position, um, but, yeah. you know, without running afoul of the law. And, uh, yeah, and yeah. Uh, yeah, I hope it still works because I do think it's important for people who can't go through what is a pretty restricted immigration process to be able to to um, make meaningful observations about that culture. And you, you can't do it unless you're able to spend a pretty good chunk of time there over a pretty long period. Right, right, right. Definitely. Yeah. I mean, the stories that you tell are, yeah, <laughs> they're not, you know, one day kind of stories. These are like, these take a long time. Um, yeah. And in 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 yeah. spite of that, I'll just conclude by saying Japan, Japan and Tokyo in particular. But yeah, you know, especially if you add in Tsuruga or Wakanai, it's still yeah. the place where I've spent the most time in my adult life. Period. Yeah. Despite the <laughs> fact that I never had a visa. So. <laughs> All right. So Wakanai, um, it, it's this super. Would you say rural? It, it's very much a, 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 it seems like a dying town at the very top of Japan, top of Hokkaido. Um, could, could you explain how you ended up going there? What interested you to, to go there specifically of all the places in Japan? Why there? Sure. When, so when I first got to Japan, I had trouble finding Ribi Sensei, trouble figuring out how to adjust to life there. And I thought after spending about six months there, I thought this isn't this isn't going to work. Uh, I'm not going to spend any more time here. 
And so I thought, well, I, I might as well take a trip and see something other than Tokyo before I leave. Uh, sure. And it just so happened that the Japan, the, the Japan dog sled championships were taking place that weekend. Um, Interesting. So I rode the JR um, uh, all the way uh, across the breadth of Hokkaido, you know, from like Hakodate to, to Wakanai and uh-huh. uh, went to the dog sled championships. And uh, it just so happened that the woman working at the tourist booth in the train station, you know, with my little Japanese, uh, I was able to communicate to her that I was just sort of seeing what I could see. And and she uh, tracked me down the next day and said, you know, there's this dog breed that's very famous. It's it's the Taro and Jiro dog, the Karaf Doken, uh, mm-hmm. who they made Nankyoku Monogatari about. So they this you know, very culturally significant dog breed in Japan, and it's almost mm-hmm. extinct. And the last mm-hmm. one's here in Wakanai, and I know the guy mm-hmm. who owns it. You want to go? You want to go see him? I said, Yeah, mm-hmm. sure, of course. And uh, so I did, and I got to know the owner of the dog pretty well. And the story mm-hmm. had never been written up in English, despite the fact that uh, that movie Nankyoku Monogatari had been turned into a Hollywood movie. Uh, and so forth. And I, so I wound up doing an article about it that was on the cover of, of Metropolis magazine. And that was an interesting enough experience and allowed mm-hmm. me to meet um, a couple of editors in Tokyo who are interested in continuing to publish my work that it wound up mm-hmm. keeping me in, in Japan. So it's really thanks to that mm-hmm. experience in, in Wakanai surrounding the dog sled competition mm-hmm. uh, that I didn't just, uh, you know, conclude my extended vacation in Tokyo and return to the United States. Hmm. And what about the census angle? How did you get involved with that? Well, it's related, actually, because Uh when I decided to write the book and felt very strongly that my connection to Wakanai, where I'd continued to visit and spend extended periods of time throughout uh, Mm -hmm. the period I was in Japan, would allow me to write about aging and population decline in Japan, um, Mm -hmm. I went back and... It happened to be in the middle of the Kokusei Chosa, or the once every five years national census. And I thought, well, this is really important for me to check up on um, because I'm here to write about population decline. And I went to the city office and Mm -hmm. uh, was immediately granted access to the census division, like no questions asked. I was allowed to choose who I wanted to shadow. So, of course, Mm -hmm. I chose this like fresh faced 18 year old, like barely looked like he was shaving (laughs) <laughs> he's a kid. He was really a kid because I thought here's yeah. like the youngest census worker in the world. Uh, mm-hmm. He's who's going to have to talk to these, all these really elderly people. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. Uh, I didn't realize until some months later that the head of the census division had been the announcer at the dog sled championships. And we'd spent <laughs> a bunch of time together in her announcer's uh-huh. booth. So she uh-huh. knew me from, from, from that previous story. And that's why she just let me do, whatever I wanted, but it took, yeah, it took yeah. me a little time to remember it. Um, it, it took me yeah. seeing an old photograph of, of, right. of the dog sled championships. Uh, so it was thanks to that previous connection that I was essentially allowed to see and do whatever I wanted mm-hmm. within the context of what was a very momentous census count in Wakanai, because it was really going to establish what the most severe period of population decline uh, in the city's history would look like. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it, it's, I guess, you know, small towns like that, everybody does a little bit of everything, huh? <laughs> yeah, you know, I, and I think uh, for people who've not been to Japan, this is a different distinction, a difficult distinction to understand. But, uh-huh. you know, there's just a difference between like Inaka and everywhere mm-hmm. else. And so Wakanai is a city. It's a city of 30,000 people with its own history of commercial fishing and and mm-hmm. light light industrial uh, uh, production or a ma- small manufacturing sector, but it's still Inaka. Like it's beyond mm-hmm. the realm of a metropolitan area that really drives the economy in any way. And in mm-hmm. a society like J- Japanese society where the transition from a bubble economy to a post-bubble economy has been so abrupt, I mean, Japanese mm-hmm. people really have that encoded in their sense of who they are and where they're living. Am I in Inaka or am I in somewhere that counts? And so when you're in a city like Wakanai, it, it's still, I think, almost everybody living there would think of themselves as living in the countryside. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, so this this 
thing, this this phenomenon of, of course, you know, the shoshi koreka, right? The dwindling youth and then the expanding, you know, elder population is something that we've been talking about or anybody that knows anything about Japan has been hearing about for years and years and years now. Now, knowing all that and going to Wakanai, was there anything that caught you off guard or did you basically find exactly what someone would normally expect, you know, a dying city and everybody's old? Like, was there anything unexpected that you found? Well, the thing that was most interesting and the thing that really convinced me that writing about Wakanai in this context was important was they rebuilt or built a, they rebuilt their train station or built a new train station uh, mm-hmm. in, shortly after my first visit. Uh, and my first mm-hmm. visit was in 2011. And mm-hmm. as anybody who's familiar with Japan knows, a new train station, a new JR station brings in prefectural funding, it brings in national funding, mm-hmm. it brings in third sector funding, and you get these really enormous, gleaming, brilliant buildings in the middle of nowhere, when and mm-hmm. if they do secure the funding to build the station. And what was done, one, they did something with their new station that was really unique. They mm-hmm. filled the top floors of the attached building with a nursing home. And wow. that was very controversial at the time that the mayor decided to do it, um, the mayor mm-hmm. who was in office at that time, because everybody down on the Shotengai, which is within walking distance, of course, from the train station, felt mm-hmm. that this was waving a white flag of surrender to the change in economic circumstances that would encourage the expansion of like Kodesha Shakai in that city, you know, mm-hmm. the, the growing of the elderly population. And so mm-hmm. I was really interested not only in the stories of the people who lived and worked in the nursing home that was inside the train station. But I was also really interested in the story of the mayor who went through with that plan at great political expense to himself and interested in what the decision to build that nursing home had meant to people in the city. Mm, That's really interesting. Like, for example, um, you know, I, I lived in Kobe for a few years and I worked at an elementary school that was rebuilt I'm not sure how long after, but after the Kobe earthquake, which, if I remember correctly, is around 95. I think it's 95. Mm-hmm. Yeah, 95. Um, so, th- yeah. So they rebuilt that, but and it, it it looked much newer than the junior high that I used to work at. That that junior high had been there for years and years and years. But um, I could tell that they had thought about this in terms of maybe one day we might end up having to turn this into a nursing home. They had an elevator, they had ramps, just the way it was laid out. I never heard this directly from anyone, but it really seemed like they were thinking about the possibility of maybe having to convert this into something else at one point. So, I mean, that's not a novel idea, but it's interesting that the the mayor got backlash for, for what they were trying to do there with the shopping center. Well, I think, you know, many gerontologists or people who study aging in Japan had already discovered by that point that elderly people in Japan express a strong preference to be reintegrated into the fabric of society as they age. In other words, they like hearing the sound of children playing nearby. They don't find it to be disturbing or annoying. They don't want to be segregated from that type of clamor. And so efforts to move elderly Japanese citizens back into the downtown core of cities and rural areas had taken place, but nobody had really had the guts to put one of to put an elderly care facility in a JR station. That seemed almost mm. symbolically too aggressive to people mm-hmm. in the city. But mm-hmm. the thing you asked me what was surprising, one of the things that was surprising is whenever you talk to people in Wakanai about things the city that had done, things that the city had done which seemed visionary in their realism, they weren't visionary at all. They turned out to be very practical. Like the mayor at that time said, you know, it revealed to me that very simply nobody else wanted to rent the space. But he had kept that fairly quiet during the backlash that ensued because he didn't want to disturb his constituents' sense of living in a city that mattered. And if he had defended his plan by saying, who else are you going to rent it to? Nobody wants the stinking space. It would have really hurt them. Um, But he turned out to be a much more practical person than most people assumed he was. Mm, Interesting. Yeah. Um, 
All right. So I, I could keep talking to you about this more and more, but I, I do want to highlight the last area in the book as well. Um, and so, <laughs> all right, same question, I, I guess, basically, how did you, you, you do this, you're working on the story about, you know, West African immigrants, refugees, uh, detention centers, you're working on Wakanai, this kind of dying city in the middle of nowhere in a way, right? The census, and then you have the nuclear angle, how did you end up there? <laughs> well, I stumbled across um, in, I want to say, 2012, uh, uh -huh. um, somebody who wanted to be a whistleblower uh, at the uh -huh. nuclear plant where he worked in Illinois. And he provided me with a lot of sensitive information about work conditions there. And mm -hmm. um, it turned out to be good information. I stuck with the story for about a year, and it was eventually published in the Japan Times. And it was it was really long. It was like an entire broadsheet. So the old-fashioned big newspapers like the New York Times, mm -hmm. if you open one, and then from the yeah. top left corner on one page to the bottom right corner on the next page was just Ooh. one story. That uh -huh. That's how that story was run. It was one of the longer pieces they'd run in the history of the newspaper. Mm -hmm. And it traveled pretty well, at least within Japan. Uh, a lot of people read it. And afterwards, I started hearing from people in Japan's nuclear industry, including in, in Fukui, where I had gone to report part of the story, uh, because mm -hmm. they, the article earned their trust by showing them that I wasn't interested in piling onto the criticisms of Japan's nuclear industry that had been made after the Fukushima disaster, but was actually interested in exploring how a more global community of safety experts and um, nuclear companies had uh, benefited from ignoring certain safety risks for a long period of time. So it, it put me in the good graces of a certain type of nuclear company employee in Fukui. So when it was time to write the book, and I left the, I left the newspaper work to write the book, to focus on writing the book full time. And I was mm -hmm. fortunate to have the kind of book contract that justifies that. Mm -hmm. So I went back to Fukui and, and tried to find a way to do that. Um, but unfortunately, being available in a place like that and being in the good graces of the people who work there is only really half of the equation. The other half, mm -hmm. and it has more to do with luck and timing than skill, is you need a story to unfold. Mm -hmm. And it happened that while I was there hoping for one, the question of whether certain nuclear plants or nuclear reactors very close to um, very close to risky very close to earthquake faults that could pose seismic risks to the reactors mm. were being considered and debated and regulated. The question was, these plants look like they're seismically risky. Should they be allowed to restart after the Fukushima disaster? So while I was living in Tsuruga, which is the largest uh -huh. city in the southern half of Fukui Prefecture, which is where you, you have 15 nuclear reactors in a very small space there. It's the largest number mm. of nuclear reactors in a single prefecture. The industry really dominates economic and political life there. There was a very intense debate going on about whether nuclear reactors, which were at seismic risk, would be allowed to restart after the Fukushima disaster. And I knew people at the nuclear regulator who were fighting to keep those plants idled uh, and people at the nuclear utility companies who were fighting to restart them. And both mm -hmm. of them began to feel increasingly that the truth about that debate was not being fairly represented in the media. And I heard from them more and more often and finally was able to identify a, a place where I could insert myself and say to people who had sensitive and interesting inside information about what was going on, if you're candid with me and you talk to me over a long period of time, I'll make sure that the record is is corrected and that what people think is going on will not be will not be the final uh, conclusion that that is drawn in the press. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, I mean, in the, in the conclusion, you also I think or in the. After the conclusion, I get, well, right at the end of the book, you explain how, you know, some people, you know, you had to change their names and that kind of stuff. Um, so was it, I guess you, you, you were extra careful when it came to the topic of, you know, the nuclear reactors and the fault lines, this last chapter in the book or last area in the book, uh, because there's, <laughs> how could I put it? Um, of course, this is a topic that 
there's a lot of strong feelings uh, and there are the people that talk to you could face certain consequences by talking to you? They they could and they will, but I don't think there's really anybody whose names are changed in that part of the book. There's oh, one not in per- that one, okay. Yeah, okay. In, in that final part of the book, because uh, you know I'm I'm making these fundamentally journalistic assertions. Um, oh, okay. Yeah, those names are real. I think the only person whose name in that part of the book is changed is is I call him Tomo Genshiroku, which you know uh-huh. it means like friend of atomic energy. So yeah, uh, yeah. of course, of course, it's not a real name, right? Um, uh-huh. And he's he's sort of a color character. He's there to give a glimpse into the private lives of nuclear employees. So I don't really make any assertions based on information mm, he okay. gave me. And so I gave him a, a, a pseudonym. But everybody else, all the characters in that part of the book, like Iria and Hoshino and these, these sort of mainstays of that narrative, those are their names. They're real nuclear executives, real nuclear regulators. Uh, and they agreed to go on the record um, because it was important to them and because I made it clear that you know when you're doing something that controverts the story that has been told not only by the mm-hmm. Japanese media about these events, but also the international media. It's really not mm-hmm. fair or even possible to um, do that without offering the names of the people who are uh, True, involved yeah. in making that argument. Um, so actually, mm-hmm. that part of the book has the fewest change names. I think where mm-hmm. I was most concerned, and the, the Wakanai part too is, I changed the the first names of some of the nursing home residents because um, they were suffering from dementia and it didn't seem sure. right to uh, attach their full identities to stories that they might, you know, that might be a little bit, um, might be, have more to do with their dementia than their, their real and true memories. Uh, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. But most of the names in the Wakanai part are real. And the part that just doesn't have many real names in it is is the part about the Nigerian community, because such mm-hmm. a large percentage of people in that community spoke with me candidly about their experiences related to violating immigration laws or doing sure. other things that could get them in trouble. So they're vulnerable mm-hmm. enough and, uh, you know, problems with immigration agencies or the police are, are, are widespread enough in that community that they really needed to have their identities protected. But um, in the other parts of the book, there's not a ton mm-hmm. of that. Okay, okay. Um, so the... The Fukushima earthquake and the disaster afterwards with the nuclear disaster, all this stuff is, you know, it kind of pops up here and there. You know, the, the book opens up with Prosper, you know, basically in the middle of, of the earthquake in a way. Right. But, mm-hmm. um, you know, and it kind of pops up here and there. And then, of course, the last area in the book is, is where you really focus on the, the nuclear aspect. But I'm wondering what what do you hope people get out of this book and the way that you look at Japan from these three different perspectives? Is there one unified thing that you think runs across all these? Um, what what would you want people to keep in mind as they read the book? Oh, that's why I gave it that horrifyingly literary title, Every Human Intention, which like any, <laughs> any, any other publisher, um, you know, I have a very storied and prestigious publisher, so they don't interfere with titles. But I think any other publisher would have uh-huh. immediately said, what well, what do you want to do about this title? Because we're not publishing the book like this. Um, <laughs> uh, so, you know, in, in a sense, the whole reason this book exists was I was trying to resist making any sort of unified theoretical or rhetorical statement about Japan or what kind of uh, place it is. But I think uh-huh. if I had to make one, I would say that um we're living in a moment when societies are really finding out very quickly how many of their values are real and how many of them are convenient myths or illusions. Mm -hmm. And Japan is finding out a lot about itself uh, through these, these three important questions of how to deal with the need for increased migration to stabilize the economy, how to address the aging Mm -hmm. of the population and what to do about nuclear safety 10 years after the Fukushima disaster. And um, Mm -hmm. I suppose the ultimate message of the book would be, I hope that uh, Japanese society uh, turns out to be um, stable and uh, it turns out to adhere to its stated values to a greater Mm -hmm. degree than we sometimes see in these in these areas um Mm. you know it's not it's not great to have 
detainees dying in detention centers. It's not mm-hmm. great to have nuclear plants restarting because people can't seem to agree about how to reform the nuclear safety system. Um, mm-hmm. But those really pale in, in in comparison to the danger of winding up in a world where all the good things that people believe to be true about themselves and 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 the societies they live in suddenly strike mm-hmm. them as as myths no longer in need of attention or maintenance yeah 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 i mean as i said earlier i mean it it's at least for me you know it it certainly is easier to identify with a, a big issue kind of like that when you have a face to it, when you have a story there and it uh, shows you the on the ground reality of what is going on rather than the one minute clip in the news where you hear about, you know, this happened with the nuclear reactor and there's people protesting it. All right, next story. You know, <laughs> Well, that's a very the nuclear energy issue in Japan is, yeah. is, is really fundamentally polarized as it is across the mm-hmm. world. There are people who believe that nuclear energy is an important source of clean energy. And then there are people who believe that nuclear energy is, is a it's playing God, right? I mean, you're taking a risk sure. that is that is not a large risk on any given day, but becomes a larger risk mm-hmm. over the course of time. And the consequences are so profound that they should just never be flirted with. I think that what mm-hmm. I was interested in doing in the book and presenting the stories of the nuclear engineers, the earthquake experts from Japanese universities, and the, the people who worked at the regulator was helping people to understand just how vicious an experience it can be if you attempt to acknowledge neither side of that argument and proceed Mm -hmm. from a place of wanting to neither restrict nor promote the use of nuclear energy, but simply to attempt to regulate it or use it in a way that is consistent with principles of good governance and transparency and being honest and candid. I mean, you really, the people who tried to do that in the years following the Fukushima disaster all got used up and thrown away, thrown away by politicians on the government side and thrown away by nuclear executives on the side of of, of the nuclear companies themselves. Yeah. Yeah. And and you mentioned in the intro, you're um, the family that you were living with in, in Suruga at the beginning, right? Your host dad had kind of a, a, a tough time after a, an accident, it seems, and then never quite got over that. He had a lot of gallows humor, um, and he pops up uh-huh. in the book whenever somebody needs to make a joke about the grim economic circumstances in um, Genpatsu Ginza or, you know, Atomic Broadway, that, that, part, of the, uh-huh. that part of the country. But he uh-huh. was among the people who were hit hardest by the nuclear shutdown after the the disaster were people mm-hmm. who were working for smaller contractors at the plants, i.e. the electrical right. companies themselves like Kansai Denryoku or TEPCO mm-hmm. or whatever. It, their employees have lifetime employment. They're going to transfer people. They're going to find right. different ways to keep them on board if they're shine. But, mm-hmm. um, you know, people who are working for small contractors, their companies just went bust and and they lost their livelihoods. And he was one of those people. And he Mm -hmm. was fortunate he found work commuting a couple hours by car each way. Most people either had to go regardless of where they were living. And Fukui is Mm -hmm. not close Mm -hmm. to Fukushima. Most of them had to go to Fukushima uh, because that's Um, the only place where, where there was work. So they became like you know, people use this term in Japan, nuclear gypsies, for for people who travel Mm -hmm. around the country doing different sorts of cleanup or radiation significant work. And certainly Mm -hmm. someone like my host father in Tsuruga was skilled Mm -hmm. enough that would be a little bit unfair to people on the lower end of that spectrum to call Mm -hmm. him a nuclear gypsy, but Mm -hmm. at the same time, or to use that expression, uh, Mm -hmm. you know, uh, which I wouldn't use because it's ethnically insensitive, but it's 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 in circulation in Japan. Sure, um, yeah. But yeah, he it would be unfair to them to refer to him that way. But people in his position, and I knew many of them, these circumstances destroyed their marriages, tore their families apart. I mean, we're talking about people who have 35-year mortgages uh, on mm-hmm. houses that they just bought before the disaster struck. And that doesn't mean restart the plants. And it doesn't mean how dare the nuclear industry have put them in this situation. It just means that the bureaucratic health of society in terms of figuring out what's safe, what isn't, and ensuring that the proper steps are taken to maintain the the safety of nuclear plants can have some really profound 
personal and human consequences that people don't foresee when they're yep. deciding whether you know a risk should be one out of ten thousand or one out of a hundred thousand before it merits spending X amount of money on safety upgrades or what have you. Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, of course, there there is just so 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 much more that we haven't even touched on. So people should check out the book. Um, but thank you so much, Drew. It was wonderful learning about your story, but also getting a little bit more context on the book. So thank you so much for making time. Yeah, Tony. Thanks so much for for um, prepping this and and making time to have the chat. <laughs> One more time, the title of the book is Every Human Intention, Japan in the New Century. And keep in mind that Drew spells his name D-R-E-U-X Richard, all right? Drew Richard. If you want to get the book and support this show, then you can use the Amazon affiliate link. That's japankyo.com slash Amazon or check out the Amazon affiliate link in the show notes. That'll link you directly to the book and a tiny percentage of whatever you purchase on Amazon will end up coming over here so that I can keep producing this show. All right, so if you need to get in touch, send me an email to mail at japanstationpodcast.com. You can also follow on Facebook and Twitter at Japankyo News. Go do that. That's J-A-P-A-N-K-Y-O News. And of course, don't forget to subscribe, rate and review. Tell a friend about the show. Spread the word. And thank you to You Know Me for providing the theme song, Oedo Controller. Link in the show notes. That does it for this episode. Next time, it's going to be uh, April 1st. That's when the next episode is going to come out. And we're going to be talking about Japanese cuisine, uh, washoku as they call it, uh, in a very um, <laughs> interesting way. I don't think you can really guess what the heck we're going to be talking about. But uh, make sure to come back for that because uh, it's going to be debunking some um, information that's been promoted in recent years about Japanese cuisine that is not necessarily accurate or Maybe I should just say not accurate at all. <laughs> so come back for that April 1st. Uh, don't forget to check out Ichimon Japan. That's my other podcast. Uh, and on the latest episode, episode 38, we talk about first person pronouns in Japanese. Uh, there's quite a few of them. And actually, we talk about the fact that Japanese may not even have any pronouns in the first place, according to some linguists. So um, yeah, if you want to find out what that's all about, go check out episode 38 of Ichimon Japan. Thank you so much for listening, and remember, go find your miniature pony. Just do it!